Thanks for joining me. I'm Adam from Matrix Requirements. Today, we're going to talk through the 510k process. In the United States, there are several points of entry for launching a medical device to market. There are three main entry points. The first is the de novo entry. The second point of entry is a pre-market approval or a PMA. The PMA is used for high-risk medical devices. And the third is the most commonly used, which is the 510k process. This video will focus solely on the 510k process for launching your medical device within the United States. So let's start off with the definition. What is the 510k? The 510k is a pre-market submission made to the FDA. The goal here is to prove or show that the medical device to be marketed is safe and effective. Medical device manufacturers must submit a 510k if they plan to introduce a new medical device to market or if they plan to reintroduce a medical device to market that has significantly changed or been modified to the extent that it could impact its safety or effectiveness. The process is named after Section 510K of the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act in the United States. The purpose of the 510K submission is to ensure that the medical device is safe and effective for its intended use before it's launched to market. So what sort of classifications are there? Medical devices in the United States are classified into three categories based on the level of control needed to ensure the safety and the effectiveness of the medical device. Class 1 medical devices are deemed low risk and therefore they are subject to the least regulatory control and most are exempt from the pre-market submission or the 510k process. General controls cover aspects such as manufacturer registration with the FDA, good manufacturing processes, proper branding and labeling, and the need to report adverse events. Some examples include elastic bandages or examination gloves. Class two medical devices are higher risk than class one, and therefore they require greater regulatory controls. And once again, the goal of these controls is to ensure the safety and the effectiveness of the medical device. Most class two medical devices are required to submit the 510K pre-market notification to the FDA before going to market. Class two medical devices are subject to general controls and special controls. Special controls can include specific labeling requirements, mandatory performance standards, and post-market surveillance. Class three medical devices are considered the highest risk. Therefore, they generally require the pre-market approval or the PMA. The PMA follows a much more rigorous approach than the 510K pre-market submission. So I'll dive into that into our next video. Class three medical devices are those that sustain human life and they're really important in preventing the impairment of human health. Some examples of a class three medical device could be an implantable pacemaker or breast implants. It's important to note that if a class three medical device is deemed to be substantially equivalent to a class two or a class one medical device, it may be possible to take this medical device through the 510K process until it's required to go through the pre-market approval or the PMA process. So in general, the 510K process is primarily related to class two medical devices. However, it can also apply to class one or class three medical devices based on its level of risk, and the intended use of the medical device. Another important key takeaway is to really be sure of the history of your medical device. There may be some specific 510K processes that you'll need to investigate further, such as the abbreviated 510K or the special 510K. As these are for specific use cases, I'll add some links below so that you can investigate further based on your medical device. So what's the process of obtaining a 510K clearance from the FDA? There are several steps designed to demonstrate that the new device is as safe and as effective 
as a legally marketed medical device that is not subject for pre-market approval. So let's jump through a high level of the 510k process. Firstly, you'll need to determine whether the 510k process is the right one for your medical device. As mentioned earlier in this video, not all medical devices are eligible for the 510k process. Once you've determined whether your medical device is eligible for the 510k process, it's a good idea to look into a pre-market submission. As a medical device manufacturer, you can request a pre-market submission meeting with the FDA. Here, the goal of the meeting is to receive feedback on studies and find out further information about the data required for your 510k submission. This step is optional, but it's really helpful in outlining the FDA's expectations. The third step is to prepare your 510k submission. The 510k submission must include detailed information about your medical device, including its intended use, classification, predicate device comparisons, technical sections, including clinical laboratory studies and clinical data, if it's possible, and labeling and manufacturing information. It's really important to keep in mind the goal to demonstrate substantial equivalence to a legally marketed medical device. Don't underestimate the amount of time that is needed for your 510k submission. It takes many internal and external resources to make sure that this is in place. You'll also need to make sure that you have full traceability of your documentation. If you'd like to learn more about traceable documentation, I'll add a link below so that you can learn more about how matrix requirements can help you. Once the 510k submission is prepared, it's time to submit it to the FDA with the appropriate fee. The FDA then conducts an internal administrative assessment or review to ensure that the submission is complete. If the submission passes the initial review, it will move on to a secondary review known as the substantive review. Here, the goal is to assess the data that has been provided to ensure that the medical device is substantially equivalent to its predicate. Keep in mind, this part of the process may involve several requests from the FDA for further information. After reviewing the submission, the FDA will provide one of the following decisions. The first is substantial equivalence. If the medical device is found to be substantially equivalent, it will mean that you can legally market your medical device in the United States. You will also receive a letter of substantial equivalence from the FDA. The second option is that they will find that your medical device is not substantially equivalent. In this case, the FDA will provide you with an NSE or non-substantially equivalent letter. In this case, your medical device cannot be legally marketed in the United States. At this point, it will be a time to determine whether you need to submit a new 510k submission with additional data, look into the de novo submission, or submit a pre-market approval. All of these cases depend on your medical device, its intended use, and its level of risk. After receiving the 510k clearance, medical device manufacturers must adhere to post-market surveillance, reporting and quality management regulations to ensure the continued safety and effectiveness of their medical device. The entire 510k process can take several months, and this really depends on the complexity of the medical device as well as the quality of the submission. To be as prepared as possible, it's really important to look into the available documentation by the FDA now. Finally, I'd like to provide you with some tips and tricks as you prepare for the 510k process. Preparing for the 510k process is a time-consuming effort. It requires careful planning, documentation, and a strategic approach to demonstrate that your medical device is substantially equivalent to its predicate. Here are my top tips. My first top tip is to utilize the FDA pre-submission meeting with the FDA. Here it's a quick win. You'll be able to gather valuable insights and understand the expectations from the FDA as you launch your medical device to market. My second tip is to be really thorough in your predicate device research. Make sure to choose a medical device that aligns with yours in terms of technology, intended use and performance. A really well chosen predicate device simplifies the demonstration of substantial equivalence. My third suggestion is to ensure that your 510k submission is comprehensive and well-organized and it adheres to the FDA's recommended guideline. 
A clear and concise submission facilitates the review process. Here it's a really nice idea to have a solution in place, such as matrix requirements, which will help you in the design phase of your medical device. My fourth tip is to back your claims of substantial equivalence with significant and strong data. This could include bench testing, clinical data, and any applicable standard compliance. Detailed documentation of your methodologies and results is essential. And my fifth and final tip is to stay up to date with FDA changes to guidance, regulations, and standards relevant to your medical device. Compliance with these alongside your readiness for post-market surveillance will ensure a smooth pathway to clearance. By focusing on these core strategies, you can effectively navigate the 510k process. If you're launching a medical device to market in the US, or you're going through the 510k process, feel free to reach out to the team at Matrix Requirements. As we're specialized in the medical device industry, we're here to help you as you launch your medical device to market. We look forward to hearing from you soon.